let's go ahead and get started. We will have one more in-person panel member joining us um, for this uh, single-use plastics breakout session. Uh, my name is Sarah Harding, and I um, have a company that I started last year called Coconut at Sea Soap Company. Um, and so my story around plastics is that I've been um, kind of in the eco world for a while now and was a farmer, but the plastics issue really hit home for me. About a year ago, I was on a surf trip with my family um, when we were in Indonesia. And so we traveled for 12 hours by boat out to this super remote island chain in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And so it's like coconut palms and white sand beaches and turquoise water and absolutely gorgeous. And I was in heaven, you know, fish, coral reefs, the whole thing. So then we pull up to these islands with like one coconut palm on it in the middle of the Indian Ocean and it would be covered in plastic. Like everything you can imagine, flip flops, chip wrappers, bottles, you know, styrofoam everything and the, all above the high tide line was solid plastic it was disgusting and it broke my heart so i decided that i could do better like myself personally so i came home and started making shampoo bars because the bathroom is you know a lot of us the kitchen is pretty difficult to eliminate plastic and we're going to get to hear um how we can do more of that um but the bathroom you know a lot of people we just, our shampoo comes in plastic bottles and it makes sense because glass would be dangerous if we drop it. But we do have another option. We have um, shampoo bars now. So that's my story. And um, let's go ahead and start with Brenna. This is Brenna Sellers and I'll let her uh, tell her story. <coughs> All right. Um, yeah, so my name is Brenna Sellers. I am the program director for Farm Hands Nourish. Uh, we are a nonprofit in the Valley that focuses on food access, um, like farmer connections, and so we do a lot of food access programs at the farmers markets, double snap dollars, senior coupons, school coins, and then during the school year, I run the Columbia Falls Backpack Program. So we do, um, we send home shelf-stable and fresh food to uh, about 260 to 300 students. Um, and we, when we got into the shelf-stable food game, that hadn't really ever been a part of our mission as an organization. We were really focused on fresh food, local <coughs> produce, getting people connected. Um, Shelf-stable food is wrapped in plastic. Um, and so we are trying to figure out, we also, the way that we pack it is in Ziploc bags. And so the way we are working on seeing how we can adjust that, sending things home maybe in um, compostable bags, but then if they don't get composted at home, that doesn't really make much of a difference. Uh, and then when it comes to our programs at the farmers markets, we are working on, <clears throat> um, we're starting with the Whitefish Farmers Market this year, working on eliminating some of the waste that occurs at the farmers market level. So uh, the Whitefish Farmers Market, for those of you that haven't been, has um, a ton of uh, ready to eat food vendors, so food trucks and that sort of thing. And so this year we are going to work on um, eliminating some of that waste by requiring compostable packaging or compostable uh, ways of distributing the food and hiring Dirt Rich to have bins there. So Farm Hands is kind of, um, is also kind of just getting into this and figuring out what we can do on the community level. Do I need to talk for longer? <laughs> you can. You have plenty of time. I couldn't remember how much time no, that I, I was supposed to talk. We allotted six minutes each, so if you okay. have more you want to say, or you can save it. Sure. Um, how, how many of you live locally? And 
have all of you been to at least a farmer's market in the valley? Cool. So, um, <laughs> quite a few of you I know, but. Um, so I just, I'll talk a little bit about our food access programs because they're um, worth more, the more people that know, the more people you can tell and kind of share. Um, so our, the programs that we run at the Columbia Falls Whitefish and Kalispell Markets, um, we are the SNAP retailer at all three markets. So SNAP, I always get this acronym wrong, um, I, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Cool. <laughs> I always say access and that's wrong. Um, so that's like food stamps, it's been renamed in the last few years. So folks that are, are low income and have, have SNAP um, are able to come to those farmer's markets and use their SNAP benefits at the farmer's markets by coming through us. Um, the farmhands booth down in the booth room has some examples of the coins that we give out in exchange. You know, we are able to slide their SNAP cards we are able to give them coins um, that have values that the farmers can accept. The SNAP benefits, you can buy anything that um, that is not hot and prepared. So with the exception of food trucks, they can use it at almost any food vendor <coughs> at the market. Um, and then we ha also participate in a double SNAP dollars program. So we have grants that allow us to match up to $20 of people's benefits. So, um, and those match, that match, those double SNAP dollars can only be used on fresh produce. So it's a way to increase the amount of fresh produce that folks can buy. It's a way to stretch people's budgets. It's also an opportunity to allow people to purchase some sort of vegetable that they maybe aren't sure about. Um, it's really, it can be really intimidating to buy fresh produce if you don't know the people in your family are going to eat it. And so if you are spending your very limited food budget on something that someone might be skeptical about, um, pretty soon you're going to just stop doing that. But so this program allows people to kind of experiment a little. Um, we also do senior coupon booklets that are worth $30 as a whole booklet um, to low-income Flathead Valley residents 62 years and older a way to help those folks stretch their budget. Most, a lot of um, folks over the age of 62 that are on fixed income, um, it can be, get tricky. I understand that farmer's markets maybe can be a little more expensive than, uh, than conventional things at the grocery store. So that's a way to stretch budgets. We do some school education, going into local schools and teaching about, um, the local food system and then inviting kids to come to a farmer's market and get a $5 coin that they can buy fresh fruits and veggies or plants that grow food as a way to participate in their local food system. Um, and then our newest program, our newest farmer's market food access program, um, we partnered with North Valley Professional Center, which is a doctor's office in Columbia Falls. We have a practitioner there that we're working with who literally hands out prescriptions for fruits and vegetables. So we um, enroll families and the prescription is dependent on the family size. Last year we had you know, uh, someone, a single person and up to a family of nine. Um, they get $7 per family member. So that family of nine got $63 a week to spend on fresh produce. We also would give out a certain amount of money for eggs every once in a while to, to um, kind of balance that out. But this program, last year was our pilot year and the, the results were pretty amazing. We had surveys every single week and we watched every single um, person enrolled in the program go from eating fruits and vegetables one to two times a week to five to seven times a week. Wow. Um, so, you know, food access, um, having access to it and having people that are willing to communicate without um, any shame, without any negative baggage behind it all, um, it can really help change people's lives, I think. Um, 
Yeah, and our, our goal with every single one of our programs is to support our local farmers, a lot of which are in this room right now, um, because, and to have more people, to allow more people to have access to that local produce, to allow, um, the big thing with being the SNAP retailer is it costs a lot of money um, to be a SNAP retailer. It's like $30 a month and you have to have it per site. So we can't have, we don't just have one retailer number. We have one for Whitefish, one for Columbia Falls, and one for Kalispell. So taking the burden of that cost off of local farmers and um, putting it on us where we were able to put in the time to fundraise and write grants. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Brenda. <laughs> Thanks. And I'd like to introduce Nolan Smith, and he came up from Phillipsburg to talk to us today about Granite Waterworks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, we've got some similarities with, with what Brenda's story is about. Uh, my wife and I, Kathy, who's, who's with us here today, she, uh, she and I got together in 2009 and started building uh, the brewery there in Phillipsburg. In 2012, we outgrew our location and our, and our capacity. And there just happened to be a water bottling plant that had been shut down in Phillipsburg and sat there um, shuttered since 2004. Uh, so we were lucky enough to acquire that building as part of our brewery expansion, but it just so happened there was a bottling line in there there's a spring that comes up out of the ground, cisterns that produces uh, 300 gallons a minute of pure mountain spring water. And we recognized there was a resource there and decided we should start bottling water. Well, there was 3,000 plastic jugs in there, over a million labels, several hundred thousand caps, and we looked at this pile of stuff and said, we're probably not going to do this. This is not right to do. We had some issues with the DEQ and Department of Health as far as permitting, equipment, things like that. <coughs> we kind of threw that aside, got our brewery up and running, and got access to this package, uh, which comes from Ball Corporation in, uh, in uh, Golden, Colorado. And uh, after a couple of years of getting the brewery going, I retired from my job working uh, in the mines and, used and uh, could concentrate fully on, on bottling water. Uh, so we rebuilt our system there at the, at the springs and had conversations with Yellowstone Park as far as their efforts to eliminate plastics within the park. Uh, they had struggled with it for several years. They had a bottled water company they were dealing with out of uh, Minnesota called the Water for Kids. And uh, it was a nonprofit. It's a really cool company that takes their money and drills wells in Africa and does all these things but the, the bottle wasn't resonating, the water wasn't resonating with people. Uh, they looked into cardboard. You've seen those cardboard boxes, boxed mm -hmm. water. Took them to their recycler and in three forks, or not three forks, four corners. He's like, what do I do with this? They're like, well, it's cardboard, right? He's like, no, the liner's plastic, the cap is plastic. Mm -hmm. I can't recycle it. So uh, through our brewery, we ended up having conversations with them uh, as far as, putting water in a package like this. And uh, so we had at the back of our mind that we needed to make this thing happen for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, we had access to the package and had a wonderful spring uh, on our property. So we invested some money in our, in our equipment and launched this in, uh, in Yellowstone Park last year. Uh, had really good success the first year. Uh, we partnered with an uh, organization called Yellowstone Forever uh, had it had in all their stores and some of their gift shops and visitor center around the park. And then uh, things kind of started to explode after that. We ended up getting a call from uh, the guys at Bog Jam in Missoula that have you know, Kedal's Amphitheater, Little My Top Hat, all that, and said, can you do a branded bottle for us? So we did a bottle for them, and uh, if you get on our website, it's kind of cool. It's a black bottle with kind of gold trim on it. looks like a bottle of whiskey or something, but it's actually the same spring water the bottle in Phillipsburg, so they have that exclusively in all their venues. Then the phone keeps ringing. I end up co-packing for an outfit in Savannah, Georgia, another one in Austin, Texas, to help them launch their brands nationwide. So our first year, we shipped 270,000 bottles 
throughout five states. Uh, we're very proud that, that we could have that much of an impact of eliminating, potentially eliminating that many bottles, plastic bottles, uh, within, our, within our region here. Uh, as far as moving forward here, we've got plans to uh, uh, launch here in Glacier Country. A lot of people have asked us, why don't we have a Glacier Park label? And it takes quite a bit of effort to make that happen, and this was just our first year. So we actually had water in uh, uh, like the Great Northern Resort. Uh, Glacier Guides took us on, Silva Cycle, uh, Sweet Peaks Ice Cream, we're shipping Yellowstone bottles here, as well as all the way to businesses on Absorbe. So, uh, just did some finalization on a, on a label here, and I just invite you to come look at this uh, after the talk. Uh, but we should be seeing this in the Flathead Valley in uh, uh, late May, early June. Also, uh, I brought a case of water. I don't know if anybody has tried any of it downstairs, but uh, welcome you to grab a bottle. Uh, we got awesome water quality. Uh, water it could be a thousand years old we really don't know it doesn't contain any plutonium or any freon so that means it's at least pre-1930 uh, comes out of paleozoic limestone units 7.8 pH 325 uh, uh, parts per million TDS so good solid good tasting mineral water Mandy Gertz, are you ready to talk? Yeah. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? I have a cold that's not the coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm farm owner and farmer at Lower Valley Farm here in Kalispell. Uh, this is our eighth year running our organic family farm. We primarily sell through a CSA program, which I'm sure here at Free the Seeds, most of the people are familiar with what a CSA is. Can you just raise your hand if you know what a CSA is? Okay, so I'm going to skip that part. <coughs> and one cool thing about all CSAs that I know of is that it's so much less plastic packaging than what you're going to get with grocery store produce, even less plastic packaging than what you get at a farmer's market. So that's just a cool thing about CSAs. Also, at the farmer's market, you're getting produce that has a lot less plastic than at the grocery store. So much less plastic. So just shopping from your local farmers is using less plastic. Um, plastic, single-use plastic, not everyone knows this as an education piece, is a part of contemporary agriculture. So plastic getting laid down on beds as a weed barrier and sometimes to keep soil moisture retained, which might be the right choice in places for some reasons with extreme limited access to water. Farming is a system and anytime you have a system you have to have inputs into a system to make things work. So. What's cool about lo buying local is that we can look at what are our systems that we have here? What do we have going for us here where we live? And one of the things we have going for us is that we do have lots of water. Water is not an issue here. So at least on my farm, and I don't know any farms that have water issues that I know of, not having enough water. We have water under the soil. There's lots of water. There's also lots of water all over the valley. So water is not a big deal for us like it would be in Central California, <coughs> Southern California, where most produce is grown in the United States. So after our first year farming, um, we used plastic to cover beds to keep weeds out. And also a challenge here is that it's cold. And it's cold at night. And plastic can help keep um, warmth in the ground, okay, overnight in our mountain air that doesn't have much moisture in the air. So we have water underground, but not water in the air. That's another special thing about here. So we have mountain air that's cold at night. It really cools off the crops and it cools off the soil. So to hold heat in the ground is another advantage of using plastic on the soil. 
after my first year farming, when I took the plastic out and threw it all away, I just, my heart said, hey, this isn't why you started doing this. This isn't why you sold everything you own and live in a yurt with three young children to throw away plastic at the end of the year because it grew vegetables on it. I also was very uncomfortable with single-use drip irrigation, which is also plastic that is made for single-use once a year. So after that first year, we were like, we're not going to do that anymore, but I don't know how not to. And so now we've had to create whole new systems that support that choice. And I think that that's a missing part from customers is that when you see plastic being used in local businesses, in local agriculture, you need to understand that we don't want to use plastic. And that if we're gonna shift away from plastic as a community, it needs to be a community effort. So we have small businesses here that want to take that step. And we need community support also. A couple of years ago, Kalispell Creamery wanted to switch from their plastic jugs to a glass bottling. And it would have been like, I think a million dollars, so much money, and they asked the community to support that transition and nobody donated to it. So people can say you want change, do you? Do you really? Do you wanna pay for it? Or do you mind paying more for products that support that? Or do you just wanna ask business owners to do it? So this year, we're piloting something in our CSA where we're gonna have 100% biodegradable plastics in our CSA. <laughs> and it's a really easy switch to make because in our CSA box, we're not doing clear plastic bags like we use at retail and at market. They're like switching from the roll of 2,000 bags that don't decompose to ones that do decompose. It's an easy switch. <coughs> We're also gonna pay much more expensive for these silo bags that are biodegradable and they'll have to be heat sealed, which then you're paying more for employees to use a heat sealer instead of running it through a twisty tie. And this adds up, it doesn't sound like much, but when you're doing a thousand bags a week, adding three more or six more labor hours on something that's the price point isn't that high is a lot and i think sometimes there's an idea that farmers you know we have an idealized job but we just like everybody else have all those price points and so it's hard in something where there's already not much of a margin for profit to put on top of that more Okay, so it's something that all the farmers here want to do. We all want to transition over to it, and it's a big investment, and we're kind of at a place where it's like asking a question of how do we do this? How do we do this here? How do we do this in a way that works for us? One of the assets we have in our community is Dirt Rich Composting has a commercial composting facility here. This is unique. Not every community has one. And so not only can we switch over to compostables as small farms and local businesses, but we have a place where we can then capture that and actually compost it. That seems like something that we should all do, that we should all be willing to pay for. Um, we were able to just slightly raise the price of our CSA this year, and that totally captures the cost. It's easy. That's an easy way to do that. And then I also do a weekly newsletter where I can say, hey, all these bags, they're compostable, here's exactly what they're made out of, sign up for Alyssa's program, and she'll collect them at your house. And we can also have uh, a bag where they can put the bags inside. So our goal isn't just to be switching one product for another, it's to have a system change. And the system change isn't just that you're getting a different bag in your box, it's that then you bring that bag back to me and it goes to Alyssa's and that they can see that whole thing and that you're part of it and it matters. So, it's like the, the perfect segue to Alyssa <laughs> Chance from Dirt Rich. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> um, I guess for just, I own Dirt Rich Compost. Uh, we've been around since 2015. 
and we're a multi-pronged company so we pick up food scraps from all over Glacier National Park and all over the Flathead Valley's uh, residences and businesses uh, and take it back to our site and process that along with a bunch of other carbon material that arborists and other people around the valley have dropped at our site, carbon material, material um, put it together and process it over like six months about and then we have a high quality compost product that we sell to farms and gardens and um, it's exciting to hear everybody trying to hop on board it and shake up the system a little bit and try and reduce plastic use and it's I think it's easier than it's ever been before because there's a high demand and there's lots of different companies out there that are providing different options for compostable plastics but not all of them are created equal and there's a lot of greenwashing that happens um, in that sector right now and it's hard when um, one restaurant has uh, plastic forks but compostable uh, bowls and then everybody assumes that it's all compostable but it's plastic that ends up in our in our bins um, but yeah I, I'm excited to, to try and figure out a, a good system to, to close that loop and I think I mean it's so cool to see everybody on board trying to make that happen and um, can she hear yes yeah, she can now hear she okay and she's got a ton of really great information about the actual compostable products more than I do. I've done a lot of research into the different kinds of brands, um, but she's, she's got the best information as far as who to be using and, and uh, who to be steering clear of in that lane. So this is Heidi. And Heidi is joining us from Bozeman, and she's going to talk to us um, about compostable options for retailers. Hi, Heidi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very well. Yay. <laughs> okay, good. I didn't hear most of what's going on, so I'm sad that I didn't get to hear all that. But um, I I'm Heidi. I started Eco Montana um, in 2012. I, before that, 10 years ago, I was actually a cherry grower in Big Fork, um, an organic cherry grower, and I was getting super frustrated with all the plastic and styrofoam that I saw everywhere. Um, so when I decided to leave that life, um, I decided to do something about it, and I started Eco Montana. Um, we distribute only compostable restaurant supplies, so we do not carry anything that is not compostable. Um, when I started in 2012, there wasn't a whole lot of different options. Um, one company that I found that is fantastic, that continues to be innovative and great customer service and just um, great all-around products is world-centric. Um, we carry a lot of their products. I wish they made everything we needed because they're such a wonderful company to work with. Um, we also carry some from Vegware, which is another company um, that has gotten, they started in the UK and have just been in the US in a lot of years, I think. Um, we have seen uh, several companies that are greenwashing things and we stay away from their products completely, even if they have, um, even if they do have some products that are good and compostable, they have some others that are misleading and um, may say that they're partly plant-based and partly plastic, um, but people who just want to do the right thing and this isn't their job to know what that right thing is um, are being duped. And um, that, that uh, hurts the end users, which hopefully is um, places like Dirt Rich. Um, because then they have to sort out that plastic. And and those people think that they're doing the right thing. Um, they think that they're buying compostable things when really sometimes they have plastic mixed in with them. So uh, we are hopefully able to help our customers with that because we just don't carry anything that isn't certified compostable. Um, we are delivering up in your area. We use Summit Distribution and uh, Western Montana Growers Co-op to get things up there. Um, and I will be up there actually on Friday the 20th 
we're, we set up a meeting, Robin set all this up to uh, have a little meeting at the Whitefish Library that morning at nine o'clock. So if anybody's interested, I'm gonna bring a bunch of samples and, and see if we can get some stuff going on up there with all the restaurants and, and even, even if you want stuff in backyard barbecue, we, we sell stuff um, by the case or by the sleeve, so we're always happy to get it wherever it needs to be to get rid of whatever plastic we can. Please add some. And um, I just recently had a conversation with Heidi while I was trying to just sift through all of this information and all the different companies out there. And I just really, um, I got the sense that she was very um, transparent and not, and passionate about making sure that the products that she's providing are the best that are available in terms of environmental, um, its ability to degrade and environmental safety. Uh, and it was really hard for me to be able to get a hold of some of these other companies that are much larger and actually get answers. And it was just so nice to be able to, to talk to you and um, know that the information you just had so much information and it, it felt like I could trust what you had to say most of these larger companies like they didn't even really have answers for me um, which was frustrating but yeah I just wanted to put that out there and say I appreciate it thanks Melissa yeah thanks so we have about 25 minutes and I can open it up for questions if anyone has questions for anyone in the panel or General about single-use plastics. Yeah. Um, this is a question for you with regard to the, the aluminum. Sure. So, the, like, so I work at the hospital, and the hospital generates a ton of waste. And um, convincing people why recycling is the right thing to do is less straightforward than it seems like it should be. But it, the issue is actually really complex because the economics. Or it's an interesting thing to look into, but um, intuitively, not using plastic seems like the right thing. It's petroleum based; it doesn't break down, so on and so forth. But you know, to be using stuff that is recyclable is better. But to be using, you know, something that is more durable than an aluminum can would be even better. Yet, sure. So my question for you is. Do you know what happens to that can when a consumer buys it, where it, where it goes, the energy used to deliver it wherever it's going? You know, is it actually environmentally friendly to do it? And this is this is very difficult answer or question to answer, even you know online trying to find an an economist's point of view on that. It's really difficult to find the answer. So I'm just wondering if you have any insight into that. Yeah, I've, I've got a couple of things we can talk about. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know, carrying something like that and going to filling stations is, is, is ultimately the way to go as far as saving energy, limiting plastic, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, some of the experience we've had uh, with these is that people may not go to an event that has or her forgot their canteen or whatever right. so then they can buy this and use that and refill it right and uh robin that was here showed me hers that she's had for what a year since october <laughs> since october that she's been using yeah. as a canteen too uh Still working. and, and <laughs> so there, so there's that aspect of, of the bottles uh aluminum is the most recycled material in america and 95% of the aluminum ever produced in America is still here, still being used. Uh, our manufacturer, Ball, says if you put this in a recycling bin, it could be a new can within 60 days. So that whole loop that we're talking about has been in place, been established, and it pays money. So we don't struggle with things like plastic, newspaper, cardboard, glass, uh, things that we find hard to recycle here in Montana. Uh, as far as the amount of energy goes, I don't, I don't have that yeah. in the top of my head. Uh, what I do know, it doesn't take any new aluminum to produce these. And uh, they have a BPA-free liner in them that keeps the water not contacting the aluminum, so the aluminum doesn't go into solution. Mm -hmm. um, do you know where that facility, is, where, I guess the nearest place that that can be recycled? Can be recycled? I guess the... Like processed. Yeah, processed, and then you're not 
not collected necessarily, okay. but actually, you know, the end spot that that's going to then. So I believe they're refined in uh, Spokane. Okay. Uh, Kaiser Aluminum, I believe. Okay. And then they make massive rolls and ship them to okay. to Golden, Colorado. Got okay. it. So okay. it's a fairly local loop here that we're dealing with. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I hope that works. Yeah, it does. Thank you for doing it. Yeah. It's definitely way better than yeah. single use plastic. Bags. And I've, I've tried to do a lot of that research too. And yeah, it's tough. I get people asking those same questions. Yeah. Not all, not all the answers are it's out there, clear. but. but uh, yeah. These are the positive things behind us. Yeah. So we had a plastics event, I don't even November was that? Here at FBCC um, yes. that Robin helped put on. And there were um, like I don't remember what their titles were, but like scientists that I were mean, recycling. It, yeah. it was very intense. Yeah. But one thing that uh, we learned was that aluminum is the only recyclable product that still has money in it in yeah. the United States. <coughs> so like there's no money, there used to be money in cardboard, yeah. no longer, no money in anything, but there's still money in aluminum. So mm -hmm. it's actually something that is worth the time and energy yeah. for the <coughs> companies because they can still sell it and make a profit mm -hmm. compared the to everything else. The takeaway that I had from that I thought it was hyper interesting is that recyclables are a commodity and like so many commodities right now the price is really dictated by what's happened on a global scale in the last 30 years with lots of outsourcing to Mexico and Southeast Asia and so when we let our regional recycling centers be shut down because it was so much cheaper to ship it across the ocean. And then now, you know, legitimately, they're like, stop sending us your trash. Now we don't have places for it to go. So those will come back, and then that comes back to systems. Like, we need to have regional systems for recycling paper and cardboard. And the reason we don't is because we made systems where we were putting cardboard on the ocean <laughs> to go away in plastics, you know, like, so it's so cool to be in a time where we can try to think of how we can have sustainable businesses that go so much farther and into so many different, with so much overlap. Yeah. yeah. Brooke, do you have a question? Yeah. I was say, can you educate us on the difference between something like a bag or a product that's biodegradable versus compostable. Can you take biodegradable items? <coughs> Do they break down the same? I don't know how I feel about the Way to go. biodegradable <laughs> items. I honestly don't know what that means. Like I don't take. Can I? Can I jump in? Yeah, yeah. you might know more than me. Somebody. Yes, please. Okay. Um, biodegradable doesn't mean anything. Thank biodegradable you. means it will break down into smaller pieces. Like it could be plastic, right? Yeah. Because right, so if you, see, if you see a shopping bag that says biodegradable plastic, it means that it has been chemically treated right down faster, but it's still breaking down into small pieces of plastic. It's not, um, it's not compostable. Um, if, it, if it is compostable, it will say that it's certified compostable on it. So that even though it's biodegradable, it is probably still plastic. And then can compostable things like go in the landfill, or they have to get composted. Like compostable, they can. Yeah, they they can go to the landfill. They they you know it's the better use of them is to go to compost. But if it goes to the landfill, it's still not plastic, and right. so it's not it's not leaching chemicals, those toxic chemicals, into the groundwater um, or into the ground. The biggest part of of what's going to the landfill is. 25% of plastics end up in our waterways. They don't end up in the landfill. So they blow off of a truck or somebody throws them out um, and that litter eventually ends up in our waterways. That's why we have the great garbage patch or several of them now. Um, so compostables, even if they don't get composted, they're still not plastic. And they take on, on average about half the energy to produce as plastic. 
can somebody talk a little bit about how you need to store them, the temperature sensitivities of products, please? Yeah, um, the clear stuff that we have, let's, let me see if I can grab some here. Any of this stuff made out of uh, the corn plastic um, needs to be stored at less than 110 degrees Fahrenheit, um, or it will start to do its job and break down. So that stuff is not good for hot items. We do have fiber things and uh, paper cups and sugar cane cups that are coated with the PLA, but they're treated a different way, so they're good for coffee and soup and things like that. Um, and the utensils are good for heat. They can actually go in the dishwasher, even though they're made out of corn. Um, but yeah, to store that stuff, you need to keep it out of direct sunlight and don't store it next to the stove and, and those kind of things. So it doesn't take super special storage, but just less than 110 degrees. It doesn't have a shorter shelf life, like for holding inventory from year to year. Yes, the, um, the clear stuff, um, they say a two-year shelf life. Um, I have had a couple of items around here that have been here longer than that, and I keep checking them periodically, and because I'm storing them okay, they're fine. Okay. Um, and all of this stuff is for single use that I have, so it's not meant for long-term use. Um, so s we haven't seen anything break down oh, before, it's, you know, before it's put into place where it needs to break down into the compost where it's got heat and, and uh, water and oxygen. So Alyssa, if we all start using compost schools, does that overwhelm your system or could you um, handle it? I think if, I mean like in terms of the whole valley versus like the people that already compost with me or like if it was just all compostable containers and no food scraps along with it then yes it would <laughs> uh, just simply so, because of like the space that it takes right up. so if we we're composting our food scraps at home but then sending compostable plastics not plastics i and i mean containers i don't know for sure but i'm willing to try and figure yeah. out systems <laughs> to make it work um i guess that's the best answer i have I, I don't know for sure but i think that there's there's an answer yeah because there's a well their their happy trash can here is running a lot of stuff through them we we did um 55 tons that's how much we sold last year most of it in the gallatin valley um and happy trash can and yes composting here in bozeman are putting a lot of stuff through their through their systems and they haven't had any issues That's great. and uh, I know that uh, Garden City in Missoula also has been and haven't had any issues They're, those guys are finishing their piles in like 19 days and they can't find any any um, pieces of, of even the they even put in some stacked cups so there was like a huge giant stack of 16 ounce beer cups they left stacked together gone in 19 days wow i've had that experience too we compost all that stuff already but not at like a huge scale and it's all right out. that's great yeah because i think happy trash can is, is composting for the co-op which they they yeah. they have yeah. fun yeah mm -hmm. that's super yeah so yeah, well, we sell, sell a lot of stuff to the co-op, so they're going through a lot of stuff. And, and while a lot of that stuff is going home, a lot of it is getting eaten in the co-op, so. Yeah. So Brenda, can you tell us about um, eliminating the single-use plastics at the farmer's market? Yeah. What that looks like? So Farmhands has partnered with Heart of Whitefish, which is the organization that makes the farmer's market happen in Whitefish, to eliminate single-use plastics among ready um, like ready to eat food vendors so that's where we're starting um, we're not ending there we're just starting there because that's the most trash that's generated at the market itself um, last year was my first year being at the whitefish farmers market every single market I think I maybe missed two and the amount of trash generated at that event is insane um, every single vendor was asked to bring at least an extra trash can plus all the ones that are around the park and they were filled to the brim every single Tuesday. 
So this year, we're working with Eco Montana and um, requiring all of the ready to eat food vendors to use compostable um, containers and to only sell beverages that are in aluminum cans. Um, so yeah, that's, so that's where we're starting. Um, and the idea is that, um, you know, there's this whole huge row of food trucks. The idea is that they will all be using some sort of compostable packaging, um, whether it's like the little cardboard boats or a plastic container with a lid. Um, you know, I think one of the, I'm, a, I'm anticipating that one of the trickier things are those, what are the snow cones or the, the icy bright color things <laughs> because they have like a, a plastic tray around and so I know that that's maybe going to be a tricky transition and so um, but the the goal is to communicate really clearly with all of the vendors um, to offer assistance where we can. Heidi offered to um, help us with the costs this first year to maybe like give us a sleeve a sleeve cost at the case price so that people can kind of get started um, so um, and we are going to have dirt rich um, bins at the farmers market um, that we're paying for um, and covers that will go over the trash cans that will say zero waste event and um, and volunteers if anyone wants to volunteer please let me know um, we're going to need a lot of volunteers at the farmers market this year to educate people whitefish farmers market is a huge tourist destination it is not just local people that have an understanding of what we're trying to do in our community it's um, if people are here for other tourism, they come to the market. We did surveys last year. It was a huge percentage of people from out of town, at least, um, visiting the market. So we're going, we partnered last year with Powdered Soul, which is a nonprofit um, that works with kids to help them pay for um, like ski racing and other um, winter sports that can be kind of expensive. and. So we had powdered sold kids at the farmers, the farm hands booth at our farmers markets, and a lot of times they were bored. Um, if, if our booth is not very, if there's not a line of people, then they get bored. So this year our goal is to have educate those kids about composting and recycling and why we're doing it, and they are going to be standing around near the sites to educate consumers. Um, there will physically be no way to throw, to just throw stuff out. They are going to have to walk a block or two away if they really want to not compost it. Um, <laughs> so, and there will, I, our goal is to have extra um, uh, receptacles for aluminum recycling. I <coughs> don't remember. Um, there's a local organization that we're going to work with to have extra aluminum recycling bins. Did you have a question? Yeah. Maybe? So, um, how will you capture, like, maybe it, um, the education part of, like, if I'm there with my stroller and my kids are eating fruit snacks, that the fruit snacks don't get in trash, does it get into the composting trash, especially without having the other trash cans? There? Yeah, um, that's a good point. So. Um, and packing it out is another huge right. education part. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and so, and honestly, <laughs> something I hadn't really thought about. So yeah. it, it's definitely like a learning experience. Sure. We keep thinking of new things that we're like, oh, right. so, um, so yeah, maybe our volunteers are going to have to have like a bag of trash for mm -hmm. things that people have brought to the market that can't be compostable. In the education part of like, you don't leave your trash when you go hiking, you know, were you still leaving it here in the park in the trash can? I think that can be communicated. Also, it's so hard to communicate with people. Yeah, um, I, the, so hard. It's interesting, I think Heidi maybe can speak to this, but um, I know that in Bozeman, when they first started requiring um, 
that everyone had compostable waste. The folks that ran Happy Trash Can and Heidi like sat at a table. There were all, they covered all of the rest, uh, from what I understand, they covered like all of the garbage cans and there was like one place where people could bring stuff and they, in order to bring things to dispose of, they had to see, see a person. people yeah. and talk to that's people. Important. So I, that's what we're going to try and do. Yes. Um, that we're in, we're going to be in need of adult volunteers mm -hmm. in addition to our powdered yes. soul yeah. because they get nervous. Um, mm -hmm. We, I mean, that's part of our goal is to like work with them and like make them feel comfortable talking. I had anyway. That's so adult that's volunteers that's great. is helpful to like ha be a support system. Yeah. I'm always looking for volunteers for <laughs> all of my programs. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, like just with the, the systems you mentioned, now like from an end user's like standpoint, like I guess we have systems as well that we're trying to implement to yeah. reduce our waste. And I'm wondering if there's like, if you see crossover between the end user and, and the business owner and these systems like working together. Like as are you asking like as consumers what can we do to help? Yeah, like just like simple like it, it's we also have budget too, so you know right. we go to the store no. and, and these things are more expensive. So absolutely, like, how do we I, make this work together? Like, it's such a thoughtful question. I definitely don't. So have they're not as, as much more expensive as you think they are. Um, not always. Um, if you're talking about styrofoam, styrofoam is stupid cheap, um, and you can't get around that but it's also just gross. Um, but when you're looking at um, a hot cup that is paper coated in plastic versus the hot cups that we have that are coated in the PLA, the corn plastic, I would bet there's less than a three or four cent difference per cup. Um, and in some cases there isn't a difference. So uh, that is a, a, a misconception and I think when you really look at the numbers, then it's not that different. Um, yeah, so you have to look at it. And we do have, like I said, like the utensils that are actually reusable um, and can go in the dishwasher. So there's there's some of that too. Can I, can I respond to that? Because I think I have something that might be helpful as a consumer as well. Is, uh, it, I think it mostly it just comes down to personal choice. It's a personal commitment and, and in, and as you make that commitment from a heartfelt place, mm -hmm. not from shame or blame, you can invite others to participate. And Sarah Harding is giving a talk next hour that is about telling your climate story. And in the con it's in the context of climate change, but it's the same way of inviting people to make a different choice around compostables and plastic. Mm -hmm. So I think listening to that would be helpful in finding a way to communicate from a place of invitation to your community, because that's really all. What, of what it's about. Yeah, yeah that's great. Robin. I think too, like I've, I've been trying to really reduce my plastics lately, just in my business and in my life. And I think it's just like anything where we need to support those businesses who are making smart packaging choices, because without that, they're not gonna survive. So, you know, I've been like with dishwashing, like there are um, laundry soap, you know, choose a company that's in a paper bag or buy, soap nuts in bulk or you know choose the collagen powder that's in the you know the cardboard container instead of the plastic container just like really going into the grocery store and just spinning forever and just looking for like <laughs> the right stuff and then support those people because that's that's how we're going to make change let's just start small I, I think it's like it can be so overwhelming and so if you can just make one small change at a time like we all need to have faith that that adds up and then an awareness that switching out one product for another is a great place to start and that will never be enough yeah. like those ideas have to walk side by side and if we can do that without guilt because guilt is just like an energy drain but in an empowered way where we say I'm filling up my car with gasoline I hate where this gasoline came from I'm so thankful for all the places my car takes me. You know, like, those can walk together, and we don't have all the answers, um, but I'm really full of hope for right now. I, I can speak to that a little bit on the retail side of things. Uh, 
couple things that we do is we self-distribute all our water ourselves at this point in time uh, to try to keep our costs down. Uh, obviously, you know, this can is costs 31 cents to produce, whereas a plastic bottle, the cap is actually more than the bottle, and we're talking around a nickel. Uh, so you put these on the shelf <coughs> next to each other, you know, we got, we got to charge more for these. But some of the retailers that have come to us said, oh, wait, that's too expensive. Our margins aren't there. We can't touch it. It's like, okay, well, then you don't get it, first of all, because you're doing the right thing. And then others will go, well, we can reduce our margins, and we can make this two bucks on the shelf so it's sitting next to something plastic, and people go, hey, it's not that too lopsided. Uh, another thing we've done is uh, all our all our mother cartons are reusable, so if you break them down, we'll give you a credit when you hand them back to us, and we can use them multiple times. Uh, some of our partners say, oh, wow, that's great. We give them bins to, re to put these in, and we pick them up and haul them back, and do that sort of thing. Others are like, that's way too much work. It's like, well, okay, that's an option we gave you. Maybe you're not set up for that, but but here's what you could do. But it's it's funny just because we have people contacting us saying, we want to be more sustainable. We want to do this. We want to do that. And you go, yeah, that's 24 bucks a case for 24. They're like, oh, too expensive. And I've got one client that uh, is a scuba diver, and they go all over the world. They're like, we don't care what it costs. <laughs> we see this crap all the time. Yeah. Bring it to us. You know? yeah. So back to the education. Yeah. And so thank you guys all for coming. It's two o'clock, and I just want to respect everyone's time. There are other sessions starting at two fifteen. I know we had a couple more questions. So if you uh, want to be super fast, sure. or if you want to stay after, if you have a specific person you have a question for. I just have a quick invitation. I'm with Arrow, and we're working with registered sanitarians on the cottage food law for an internal rule change to expand the list of cottage foods and also trying to help support farmers and farmers markets to reduce their plastic packaging um, and labeling within our our food safety laws in the state so we need to hear your stories about the barriers you're hitting so that we can help bring those up um, to work with our Department of Health and Human Services to kind of iron those out so aero a-e-r-o-m-t dot org is our website and I'm Lindsay feel free to come come talk or send me an email thanks so much for yeah. mm -hmm. that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you.